Hello, Assalamu alaikum everybody. Hope you're all safe, sound and healthy. And perhaps I'm too late, perhaps I'm not. Many people are late, even if I am late. Many people are basically on the same page as I am on a global level, or globally speaking. I'm talking about international people, internationally speaking. So, we're going to talk about this question that um, obviously none other than an Indian would decide to put it as their, um, you know, YouTube title that why is Pakistani music getting so popular yeah first of all an answer to that it's not getting so popular it always was I mean after all as Indians you should know that considering the fact that Bollywood has copied over 800 songs from Pakistan and that is just that we know of you understand 800 Pakistani songs stolen pirated literally photocopied, you know, um, by Bollywood. And you know why, I mean, why it is actually very shameful is because Bollywood is supposed to be the biggest industry of the region. And when the biggest industry of the region shamelessly rips off of other countries, you know, uh, because, you know, they think they can get away with it. And it's not just Pakistani songs. You will find out that they've copied Arabic, Turkish, even European. You know, if you go to Eastern Europe side, they've copied those songs. And they make them, in, you know, popular hits and all. And then they have the gall to say that these songs became popular because India put them in their movies. Actually, you're wrong there again. It's because these songs are very, very popular already that India has taken them. After all, how else would India know that that song existed? It's because the song is so popular, it's going viral. That's why India knows it's, you know, it exists. And that is why Bollywood copies it. I mean, hello, don't try to make it a chicken and egg sort of a thing. No, India is not the one responsible for, you know, making songs and singers popular. And you know, the least India would could do as a big industry you know bollywood industry is that they should at least give credit where it's due but of course why would they because then royalties would come you know it's not free i mean i remember that you know um, one of the other things that um, uh, one of the other reasons why pakistani music has always been very popular is because okay let's look at it through history um pop in the South Asian region was literally introduced by Pakistan by the very young, you know, uh, sibling duo singers, Nazi and Zoe Bhassan. As you know, even today in America, you know, she's celebrated, um, she's even celebrated by Spotify, she's celebrated by everybody who knows music all over the world. And she was basically the, the pop queen of Pakistan and then she became the pop queen of the whole South Asian region okay the whole South Asia and why is that is not because India you know suddenly found her and then you know let her sing as a you know playback singer or as an OS for OSTs or um, you know in all their musicals or whatever you like to call them seriously you know, for the lack of a better word it's not that because she sang for so for some of their most popular movies. It's because she was already a queen, a pop queen in the whole region. You know, she was already very famous, she and her brother both, you know. And they were already raved about in the region. And that is why they got offers. That is why she got offers to sing for popular Indian movies. You know, and she was very, very young. They were both very, very young when they came in this field. And they were very young. So obviously, that's how they, you know, were into pop. And so they introduced pop in the region where pop was not yet a thing. You know, similarly, in so many ways and in so many, it's various time lengths, Pakistan has been introducing um, original, <clears throat> a variety of music, but original always original um, in fact until the 1990s even the movies even the Pakistani movies were ripped off 
literally like a to z even the dialogues nothing nothing was left you know that, that you could say that oh no here they did a little bit different no they ripped off even the pakistani movies you know bollywood the indian film industry ripped off pakistani movies all the way till the 90s and you know i think the reason why pakistan's music has always been evergreen um as we know pakistan's always known for its dramas and it's known for its music now the dramas i would say at at least since i have seen the glorious days of pakistani's dramas the golden period to me nowadays pakistani's dramas although they're still extremely popular from what i hear but to me they are not at all what they used to be in fact i refused to work in the pakistani media because people wanted me but then they also wanted to tell me what to write they wanted me because i was original but they wanted to tell me what to write and i was like listen if you already know what to write why don't you just save the money and write it yourself so there's that so i don't think i think originality with dramas are concerned is out the window now in pakistan and i think that if you compare it to the previous dramas i'm sorry but we have regressed not progressed but amazingly in the music side we have constantly progressed in so many ways and on so many levels and that is very very heartwarming to be honest it's a very very pleasant surprise because to be honest i was out of the music scene as well for a very long time because i'm not very much into music anyway um so you know when i just saw how the whole world was raving about um you know uh, the musicians in pakistan and they were you know looking at nescafe basement and they were looking at pepsi battle of the bands and they were looking at coke studio these are all uh, when they started off years ago i used to watch them years ago so imagine that to me they're pretty old and i was actually quite surprised to see that they're still going on and that they're going on on a bigger better level as in you know literally now the whole there there's a whole global audience now for them i did not know that to be honest so when i suddenly saw the latest you know the season 15 uh, and season 14 some of the songs um now i actually loved what they what zulfi did you know i mean obviously the pioneer of coke studio as in the one who actually started the whole concept and who was also the director original director composer and the one behind it all in the beginning for the first seven seasons and then again i think season 3 12 and 13 um that was ruhail hayat and he's an amazing musician and he's the way he always tried to stick to original concepts keeping things very simple studio wise you know it was studio so it looked like a studio and you know you could see you know everybody jamming and you know and chilling and it was amazing how he produced a lot of fusions and remixes and the one thing that he did um the most was pairing up uh, a very experienced singer with a new singer you know or pairing up uh two legends um you know together or you know so he's done a lot of that and i loved his concepts yes but then you know i just was out of the whole thing for a long time i traveled abroad as well i went back abroad then you know i stayed then again i came back then you know all the whole life taking its course blah de blah so when at that time zulfi he was in uh nescafe basement if i'm getting my facts right here so and you know nescafe basement also produced very very different it was very different from the from coke studio as in you know the concept the the style you know they went for instrumentals then they went for you know uh indie rock and all and and pepsi battle of the bands is i think majorly the go towards um rocks you know i think i think yeah i'm saying rocks because it's the different rocks they've done uh indie they've done heavy metal type they've done uh slow rock i think yeah i think i've seen more rock or i might be wrong but i've seen more rock uh, generally 
there as opposed to you know in coke studio where you see more fusion and in nescafe you see again fusion but a very very different sort of so it's all different i'm glad to say that all three produce very very different concepts very different so you can see a lot of flavor a lot of variety in each one of them that's a good thing and again that shows that shows the abundance of originality in the music arena you know of pakistan and the progress that there's an undying unwavering progress where they are showcasing the original talents of the singers but at the same time you know letting them be versatile and pushing their limits so now zulfi is in coke studio right so obviously there's this whole dilemma of coke studio where i think um i also do not watch it because you know the whole boycott thing you know because at the end of the day even though coke has a local factory in pakistan but again ultimately the umbrella company is what gets the money and the umbrella company is you know all for israel and so obviously that's why you know as muslims we're all boycotting um coke and we're boycotting even pepsi and we're boycotting all of those even nescafe we're boycotting them so you know i will not be surprised if although the global audience has picked more and more of of our stuff from you know these th- three sponsored programs but uh i think pakistanis on the other hand you might be having lesser and lesser audience i don't know i might be wrong i might absolutely be wrong because you see on the one hand where you have this whole thing going on about coke on the other hand you have um coke studio and you know working with locals you have 100% locals working and they're working for the benefit and you know towards the you know uh towards showcasing pakistan's true identity so you know there's that conflict going on and i think i wouldn't be surprised if you know um they're aware of it and are cashing it on it i don't know i'm talking about the coke industry not about the people working in coke studio not at all but in any case point now let's just get that out of the way so point being i haven't been watching coke studio but i've been seeing a lot of people raving about you know the songs and most of the songs are obviously from coke studio and you know again nescafe and those who are into rock and stuff they are raving about musicians from uh pepsi battle of the bands and obviously there is coke studio india and coke studio bangla but to be honest uh, coke studio pakistan is on a whole new level so usually abroad the you know in other different countries in europe and america and canada australia when they say coke studio they automatically assume it's pakistan so number one i think you need to you need to realize that coke studio uh, some of them have i'm very glad to say there are many voice coaches and other you know reaction um a video hosts that that have ensured that they mention that it's coke studio pakistan because they do realize that there is coke studio india and there's coke studio bangla but now not naming names but there is definitely one uh you know video uh one youtube you could say um that they were reacting to a pakistani very obviously a pakistani song but they kept on and on saying indian india india and i just stopped i didn't even watch the first time they said indian i was like that's it i'm not even watching them i don't care if they're raving about the singer but if they call him indian one more time i will kill somebody right now so and i went down and i noticed how so many people corrected them and you know the least they could have done was to change the title you know they've seen about 4 to 500 people in the comments correcting them you know so for crying out loud the least you could have done was to change the title you know because these are not indian stars these are not indian singers these are pakistani singers and you've just offended us on a whole new level again you know i mean can't you read coke studio pakistan can't you read it when you 
take those clips, those videos from the Coke Studio YouTube channel. And by the way, yeah, here's another correction. Some I've noticed some people actually think that Coke Studio is a YouTube channel. It's not a YouTube channel. Coke Studio has created a YouTube channel so that it can upload all the episodes that they have been running on TV. Yes, all these three studios, you know, the Pepsi thingy and the Nescafe basement and the Coke Studios, these are all TV produced shows, okay? These are all produced for TV channels. They're aired on TV, they're broadcast on TV. And then, you know, just for more exposure, they've all made their YouTube channels where they upload all these episodes after they've aired on TV. I would have thought people would realize that and know that as common sense, but okay, just in case, I understand the confusion, no worries there. Just thought I should correct people who are confused. So it's not a YouTube studio channel, it is an actual studio and they actually produce for TV, okay? So this, this is a TV show, this is a TV music show. Okay, so yeah, okay. So I'm actually very glad to see that there are those who, who take their reaction videos very seriously. So they don't just go through the song and then talk about whatever it is that they like, you know, uh, and all. They actually try to understand and they even go and check out the journey, the behind the scenes thing, which I think Coke Studio has done very, Zulfi actually, Zulfi in particular has done a very, very, very good job of that, that he wants people to know. Because for example, you know, there are two very most popular songs, most absolutely that, that are driving people crazy all over the world, you know, and one is Turi Jandi by Shazia Manzoor uh, and Hassan Rahim, right? And the other one is... Oh God, I just blanked out. I can't believe I just blanked out. Yeah, the other one is Pia Pia Calling, right? Which is by various artists, predominantly Norwegian artists that are um, Indian, Pakistani, Arabic, and Iranian-based, as well as Norwegian-based. And then you have Pakistani, uh, local Pakistani artist. So, you know, uh, it was a collaboration with Quick Style. So... Quick style is where you have, you know, two of the three uh, Pakistanis, Pakistani Norwegians, and, you know, and you have two Norwegians. And then you have, you know, uh, I think he's a Thai Norwegian. I, I'm sorry if I'm wrong. But I mean, the quick style is a very, very famous dance troupe. And they got famous by uploading that video, if you remember, which they danced. Um, they danced to different songs, a very choreographed dance um, and amazing moves on the wedding of one of their friends who is part of the quick style troupe, obviously, one of the brothers, one of the Pakistani Norwegian brothers. So, you know, when they put that on YouTube, it just went viral and the whole world got mad. And so, you know, they gained a lot of attention. And so when they collaborated with uh, Zulfi for Coke Studio, uh, I think they were both in season 14 and 15. Um, so for Pia Pia Calling, they basically called Carpe, and Carpe was originally Carpe Diem. So Carpe is supposed to be like the biggest Norwegian band in Norway, as in it's supposed to be what uh, you could say vital signs in Janoon and, you know, um, you know, Ali Zafar and Atif Aslam are to us, you know, we have too many names to mention, but in their case, you know, you have Carpe. And then there's another big name uh, in the Norwegian uh, music field, and she is Dilara, right? So Dilara is from of or Iranian um, origin or descent, you can say her parents were Iranians. Then they migrated to Norway and she was born there. So there you go. And so, and the same is actually with the quick style, the Pakistani brothers, you know, if I, if I'm not wrong, you know, their parents, their parents moved there, but you know, the, the boys basically belong to Norway. So, and in Carpe, uh, you have an Egyptian or origin, uh, who's Mekdi, and then you have, 
uh, Patel, who is of the Indian Gujarati origin, right? So this is where you get all these various colors, where although apparently everybody is from different countries and different ethnic groups, but one way or the other, we're all related because you've got Iran, you've got Pakistan, you've got India, which is like literally like we're the closest things to each other ever, you know, uh, not just border wise, but culture wise too. We're like the closest things to each other. And then you have Egypt. And so, you know, again, we can relate to Egypt on a huge scale, you know, so that's where the whole other identity thing comes up where you're in a loop and then you know so i mean and then you've got uh you've got norway connecting through them to us so i mean it's lovely it i think it was a very lovely concept um because as uh I'm, and I, the way zulfi explained it i loved it so i think people need to go and see the behind the scenes the making of pia pia calling right by the way, Pia is an Urdu and Hindi word. Okay, so Pia literally means beloved. Okay, so yeah, I don't know why they didn't add the word, uh, the, the the translation for in the subtitles. They have English subtitles, but I've but yeah, I've noticed, and other other people who tried to listen to watch the subtitles, they also were saying that they don't know why Pia isn't translated, and they had to look it up. Yeah, I don't know why Pia is wasn't translated. I understand it's part of your chorus, but Pia means lover or beloved or beloved. So I mean, you know, you should have you should have you know sort of translated that in the subtitle you know so anyway so these two now Turi Jandi also one must see the making because now the way they explained why they put that set how they put that set what the whole concept was and the fact that the designers you know when they talked about being heavily anti-colonial you know, I was like, you got me there. You got me there because I am all about, you know, retrieving one's identity. My whole problem, if you look at even in my podcasts throughout, is always identifying the fact or, you know, or pinpointing the fact that, you know, post-colonial world, how, how we are forced to, how we were stripped off of our original identity and in the name of pseudo culture and in the name of you know we're actually still dragging that colonial carcass you know with us and yes because the the as you know this is something again that imran khan time and again reminded the people of the world and the people of pakistan is that originally pakistan was the fastest developing country in the world Remember, as this is something that I've also talked about in my podcasts, is how literally other countries that are right now at the top of their game, they literally borrowed those blueprints from Pakistan. So while America came and then interfered with Pakistan's progress and screwed with us completely, you know, the other countries grew. China, Korea, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore they grew so yeah that is that is something that literally touches the nerve you know for us when we think about it when we think about our identity and how we had not lost our identity when we made pakistan and we were still so free spirited we were so modern we were so global we were so hit and happening you know people from all over the world would come to study in our institutions princes Yes, we had princes coming from different countries to get our education. We had a lot of foreign students coming to Pakistan to get education. We had a lot of people literally coming to Pakistan whenever they had crisis in their countries, like from Iran and, you know, we still have people running to us from Afghanistan. But I mean, you know, Pakistan was like the land of, you know, of prayers coming true, dreams coming true for people. And now it's a nightmare, it's a hellhole. But anyway, now the point is that when they said that, you know, we wanted it to be ours because we have a rich identity, we have a rich, rich culture that is, you know, thousands and thousands of years old and, you know, 
and why why would we want to you know colonial colonialize everything about us so i mean i think it's more than enough that we're fusing music already guys seriously so yeah i mean you know although actually to be honest uh when i saw the set in the beginning i was like yeah is this 60s 50s pagas like 70s pagistan and so when they explained how it was actually you know uh, both past and the future or and, and you know uh, just various timelines and uh, colliding with each other in a glitch that occurs so i was like okay because i was initially thinking it's all matrix style you know or it's a person that's trying to go into a different time into the past you know and something you know like back to the future sort of a thing and and i know, i noticed i wasn't the only one who was thinking that but amazingly amazingly um you know there was one um youtube uh youtuber who nailed he just nailed it you know uh every time he watched these two most complicated songs he just nailed it and i was like wow man you're the you you did even better than i did <laughs> so point being that these two songs um are extremely famous and so you know people started talking about you know pakistani music and this and that and you know i was is just that i would thought that it would be a nice time to remind people that actually pakistani music is not popular now it was always popular but just like pakistani rice it's always pirated it's smuggled and then you have the indian stamp on it and then india shows to the world and says it's ours that's basically what's going on so i am actually a very a very obliged to those who have put the word pakistani very clear you know whenever they're referring to coke studio or whenever they're referring to the songs the singers the music the musicians you know i'm so glad because there are still one or two of those ignorant fools who are pissing us off by not even bothering to check that it's coke studio pakistan you're taking it from coke studio pakistan and you can't see the word pakistan and you keep on raving about indian music and indian singers seriously are you doing it deliberately i don't know in any case you i'm not the kind of person who would sit and watch your video in the first place the minute you people say india the first time the minute you say indian singer or india and i see that this not india it's pakistan i just turn off that video and i'm like that's it i'm not watching anything from these guys because they're so ignorant and they can't even be bothered to correct themselves you know so you know when you want to react to something please find out exactly what it is that you're about to react to don't just go around changing the whole country you know know what it is be clear about it so that's number 1 and number 2 as i said in the music industry pakistan has always been very famous it's just that people always seem to as i just you know proven here they always seem to want to you know erase the name pakistan you know from that singer's identity when they want to rave about him so if you're going to bring politics you know um into this into the music i mean it wasn't enough that you brought politics into cricket it wasn't enough that you brought politics into sports you know now you want to bring politics into music i mean seriously what what's wrong with you people go get your heads fixed right uh i think if you go way back way back to the 60s or the 50s or even you know yeah the 50s even 40s but yeah let's talk about 50s so the reason why um pakistani music and film industry was originally always so powerful was because actually to be honest the original um indian film industry which calls itself bollywood now um or the original founders and the original stars the musicians the singers um the financiers everybody involved in the indian film industry were muslims you know like as you know even you know you had 
uh, Dilip Kumar and you had um, amongst the singers you had Rafi and all these I mean basically when India and Pakistan you know when the partition happened and Pakistan was made um, most of these people from the film industry being Muslims a good majority of them they came to Pakistan now as you know India I mean those who know history would know that India cheated in Pakistan on many ways for example they kept a lot of the stuff um, and they did not give Pakistan a lot of the stuff they stole a lot of the stuff that was on this part you know and I'm talking about the then technology the technology of, of that time or e even public transports of that time you know the radio equipment of that time the television you know the the studio the tv studio all all the equipment used at that time so i mean they literally stole whatever they could and they kept whatever they could you know even trains yeah they gave broken down trains um to pakistan and they kept all the other trains so i mean you know they did all this kind of you know petty petty childish um you know stupid Nazi sort of things so at the end of the day um, Pakistan was literally left with nothing and so Pakistan literally literally the people of Pakistan worked with nothing and they built Pakistan from scratch and that is why the whole world was actually amazed you know you would be thinking why was the world so amazed that Pakistan was so you know developing so fast that it was known as the overnight you know uh, developing nation it's because of these facts, I guess. You can say that. You know, the fact that Pakistan managed to accumulate so much money in the treasury because there were so many, you know, again, remember the elites, the original elites in India, they were all Muslims too. They also were here in Pakistan. They put a lot of their money, their assets, you know, in, into the Pakistan's treasury. And so Pakistan was, you know, becoming rich and then they were taking care of things and, you know, all the experts in the field, in certain fields, they were Muslims. In certain fields, not all fields, okay, in many fields, obviously, they were not Muslims. So we had to also, you know, make do with that by having non-Muslims. Uh, or people from abroad, you know, and getting them in and all. But that's. But when it came to the entertainment industry, the good majority were Muslims. Now, because India, as I said, kept uh, basically the all the equipment, the instruments, and everything. So some of the uh, Muslim entertainers, like Muhammad Rafi, they were sort of forced. You could say um, they were forced to go back to India. Remember, um, the, during the 50s even, until the 50s, or even during the 50s, you can say, um, there was a lot of movement between the two countries and without any any restriction. And it means, you know, there, there was a whole decade, a little over a decade that was there for uh, people of the two sides that they could choose so they kept on moving back and forth and back and forth until they actually found whichever place it was that they felt more settled you understand so many people who moved to india decided to come back to pakistan because this was where their homes were uh, many people who were who had shift, moved to pakistan they thought that no it, it was it was better that they go back to india because they were more familiar and they had their also remember india poached many of those uh, performers and entertainers you know Muhammad Rafi being one of them you know where India literally literally begged him to come back with incentives and everything and because over here things were still being set up and you know he, he couldn't get his bearings so although he tried to resist for as long as he could but ultimately he decided to go back so there was a lot of you know back and forth back and forth of many famous people in both the sides as well by the way not just Muhammad Rafi, you know. There was Noor Jaha. She decided that no, she's staying here in Pakistan. Um, she was, she, I guess she felt more emotionally uh, attached to Pakistan uh, than India. And although she was actually the, a legend, she was already a legend in India. I mean, Lata Mangeshkar was nothing compared to Noor Jaha. In fact, you would say Lata Mangeshkar got her break in India because Noor Jahan never went back to India 
although i mean don't be offended i'm just saying it uh, on a technical basis although i'm sure that lata would still have been you know uh, a, a huge thing in india but the thing is that you know at the end of the day noor jahan was already a legend you understand so lata was way her junior that's what i'm trying to say so yeah so that's how you know a lot of movement so a lot of changes a lot of back and forth but at the end of the day essentially even now as you will see predominantly the actual actual you know a powerhouse behind the indian film industry you know has remained you know muslims until obviously in the recent recent years the extreme hinduism that came the you know uh, with the you know if you remember the massacre of Guj- of gujarat the muslims uh, which is now the famous the infamous prime minister of india you know the the butcher of gujarat you know so he and his his bjp you know they were all into fanaticism and terrorism so the extremist hindus you know they thought that no the muslims do not even have why should the muslims even have power within the entertainment industry they literally even try to change because now notice how you keep on saying hindi hindi but actually it's urdu that's being used in the indian film industry yes and the singers even today even today the songwriters the lyricists they write in urdu the singers have to learn urdu they have to learn how to correctly pronounce urdu they have to learn how to read urdu in order to sing okay so they when you know the fanatic hindus when they you know wanted to make india you know an all hindu nation which they're still striving for then one of the things that they uh, did was they tried to force the, the bollywood industry to you know remove urdu and go to their version of hindi right which meant a lot of words a lot of sanskrit words which even the indians do not understand and if you remember that kon banega crorepati was their first official attempt at that which amita bachchan was obliged because at that time he was actually a member of their party of their political party of the hindutva you know party and he was like you know always trying to speak in uh, pure hindi although if you look at all his movies he's been speaking pure urdu pure urdu throughout his career as an actor and yet you know he was obliged to speak pure hindi and actually there were a lot of complaints by even the indians by the audience the public they were like we cannot understand a word of what the man is saying can he please speak in sp- simple hindi aka urdu right so yeah remember the original language is urdu hindi stems from urdu yeah i i don't care how anybody tries to rephrase it this is historical fact the original language was called urdu the british uh called it hindustani because well because the muslims called it hindustan the country and so from that the british were like oh it's hindustan oh they're speaking hindustani you know and uh, people like to give the british the credit for spreading urdu uh throughout india and making it the kind of uh, language that it is today that that it's given national scale but actually the only, the truth is that urdu was actually formed so that people from abroad the muslim rulers and their soldiers and everybody that were from abroad should have one common language that they could communicate with the locals so there was an original urdu language that actually existed and then they just added to it because that was the easiest language that they found they could communicate it communicate in and so they added turkish they added persian they added arabic you know whoever from whichever origin they came they just added more and more words and you know made it a communal language which originally it was known as the army's language for that reason it was known as the army's language because the muslim army that were from different countries you know different muslim countries from all over the world when they were joined here with the locals you know and when they worked together they had to communicate together so they picked that you know language the original 
language that was closest to Urdu. Um, it wasn't called Urdu. And anyway, so then they mixed all these words in and they called it Urdu, right? And so the British called it Hindustani. But in any case, point is, it's Urdu. I don't care what you call it, but it's Urdu. And from Urdu stems Hindi, where they decided that they would add more and more Sanskrit words, localize it a little more. And there, because India did not have a national language. Only the Muslims of India had a national language. First it was Persian and then it was Urdu. And that national language automatically became the language of Pakistan because it was the Muslim's language. Now India then was at a loss because India did not have a common language. So it had to continue with Urdu because it was the most popular language. But they couldn't call it Urdu because we call it Urdu. So they decided to plagiarize it and make it Hindi and add a little more of their local Sanskrit words that is it that is the simplified conclusive briefing of the history so as i said originally the whole industry was also <clears throat> created by funded by all the artists were the musicians the actors the performers the finances everybody in the original bollywood were muslims and most of them transferred here they came here they migrated here. Um, some of them went back, as we said. So as a result, you know, those original minds, those original musicians, you know, they continue to thrive here. They continue to work here. Similarly, the other reason why Pakistan's music is so rich is because, remember, we've not just got our old Indus culture running through the Aryan culture, we've also got the Muslim culture coming through. So that rich culture that we have, you know, which has already gone through centuries, you know, and already has fused into one, you know, and so that is our, you know, Sufiana music, which people give credit to Amir Kusro to being the pioneer of the whole Sufiana vibe or, you know, the whole Sufi um, music and poetry, not mu music, more poetry, because originally Sufiana Kalam was not music, it was just poetry, right? So as you can see from the name Kalam, Kalam literally means a conversation, okay? So it's poetry. And it's, it's the form of poetry in which you're talking, you see. You're talking about yourself, you're talking to yourself, then you're talking to God, then you're talking about God. And it's always about your spiritual, your spiritual inner self and, you know, uh, your spiritual connection with the other realm, which is God's realm, which is where we came from and where we have to go back to. So that is, you know, what we call Sufism. So... People um, say that it was Amir Khusro who originally pioneered the whole thing, the whole Sufism thing. And obviously because Pakistan is, you know, the predominantly Muslim and because it is on our side of Pakistan that all those people who were into Sufism, you know, they all came here. So they do say that it was predominantly a part of Punjab. And again, that part of Punjab that falls into Pakistan. So yeah, automatically that just translated here as opposed to in, obviously in India, it wouldn't. And so that is that, that richness, that music, that, that uh, you know, that richness of poetry, you will not find in India. So you will see that India tends to copy a lot of our mystic sufi let's call it mystic okay for the so a lot of our mystical poetry is literally ripped off by india in bollywood and the worst part is that they try to romanticize it and that is a no-no for us because this is a purely spiritual mystical thing you know you're taking a purely spiritual religious mystical thing and you are utilizing it on a human being so you're what you're doing is shirk 
basically. And what makes it even worse is that when you see that there are Muslim singers, songwriters who are ripping off these kalams, this, the, you know, these mystic poetries, and then, you know, they, they sort of give slight changes to them and they romanticize them for, you know, human form. And then sometimes what they do is that they try to copy the concept. So that sometimes what they're doing is basically they're not even ripping off the original poetry, but they are ripping off the whole concept. So they're trying to copy the concept, but applying it to human beings, praising other human beings as if they are equal to God and should be worshipped as God. You understand? So that again pisses everybody off because the words that they're using are the words that we use exclusively for God. You understand? Any Muslim can understand that. There are certain words that you use exclusively for God. I mean, as soon as you hear the word, you automatically relate it to God and to worshipping Him. And then they are incorporating those words into their songs, thinking that, oh, it will give a very, very cool, you know, vibe to the songs and it will be just as good as Pakistani songs and we're going to make it. No, you, what you're doing is you're screwing with the whole concept. You're screwing with the songs. You're screwing with the original concept and you're actually pissing people off especially the muslims you're pissing all the muslims all over the world off is what you're doing and if you're doing that deliberately then you need to be shot seriously because i don't care about you know your speech this is this is not equal uh, this is not you know freedom of expression and or freedom of speech no this is straight out hindu extremist nazism at play if that's what they're trying to do but sometimes someone argues that you know you can't say that because the people involved are again muslim songwriters and then that pisses you off even more because you're like how can you be a muslim and not know the difference here you know you don't you don't even know that what you're doing here is pure utter shirk and the whole lyric you know it started with you know them trying to copy that muslim vibe when uh they did the chaya chaya song if you remember you know with shahrukh khan so just ki zabaan urdu ki tarah if you remember so you know so they're trying to like you know um praise the 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 obviously he's praising the girl and he's that he's fallen in love with and she's supposed to be from occupied kashmir and so he says that you know um obviously so she is muslim and so you know her her language is like urdu and she's this and she's that and then you know and then he uses words which is actually it it i guess it pissed people off even more because shahrukh khan himself is muslim and the the person who composed the music is a muslim ar rahman and i think ar rahman ma- made the lyrics too i'm not sure i don't remember it's such a long time and you know the people the muslims in india were highly offended and i think rightly so because especially when all the people involved in making this piece of song were muslims it right down to the actor acting it and you know you're like what the frack bro what's wrong with you don't you know that you're committing straight up shirk these are words we do not use for human beings at all you know so the wor- the like the verbs like you know uh, the words where he's talking about you know the quranic ayats and applying it to her are you crazy like nobody would even do that nobody this is straight up shirk this is straight up shirk you know and so you know they that was just the starting point and because of the uproar in the muslim community they kept a low profile for some time but then they started it again and on a you know full on gear you know so it was like they were like deliberately that's when we you know as i said you would say that they're deliberately doing it to offend the muslims you know so that is spreading of extremism spreading of hatred insulting another religion that is in no way freedom of speech if the, if that is what you people call freedom of speech then you shouldn't have a problem with us swearing at jews and you shouldn't have a problem with us swearing at extremist hindus you know 
so why is it that if we have a problem with jews and hindus and we don't even swear them by the way but we talk about hard facts and then suddenly you feel oh you've incited hate speech you've gone and incited people in hate speech yeah what you're doing that is hate speech when you talk against the palestinians and you actually allow those israeli zionists to go online and on your cable tv and on your news outlets and spew rubbish and literally abuse and dehumanize the palestinians and you know that is hate speech and inciting hatred okay and so that is not equal, you know that is not freedom of speech okay freedom of speech is muslims defending them themselves or muslims defending the palestinians and saying yeah okay you know what all these zionists they need to go back to where they came from and they need to be judged as war criminals okay that is freedom of speech but no according to you that is hate speech so i mean you see the same the same thing that is why we usually say that india and israel are two sides of the same coin or or literally they're one side one flipping side of the coin really it doesn't matter which side you turn it's it's one because they're doing the exact same things they're deliberately invoking and provoking and inciting hatred you know and they're deliberately insulting another group of people that do not belong to their religion and they have committed a lot of terrorist activities against said religion or said group of people right so yeah so i mean the lack of orig- originality in the f- film industry in the indian film industry there you know the fact that pakistan is, has such a rich culture that mainly stems from our religion again because notice that the songs that as i said they're always trying to copy are sufiana kalams right these are mystical poetry or mystical poems and so they do a very bad job of it because they themselves are not original so they either just literally do a photocopy you know they literally just copy the whole thing and they just rip it off or they try to create something mimicking this genre and they do a very bad job of it in any case right by adding shirk and all because they actually don't even know they don't know what words are supposed to go where and what are not supposed to be used for human beings uh, you know as opposed to for god so that is why you know it's um, as far as we are concerned their songs apart from being unoriginal are also right down moronic in the sense that it displays their ignorance you know and obviously the world uh, you know the people abroad they have no clue because they don't really know and so india is like literally you know showcasing its ignorance to other people who are obviously unaware of, of you know actual facts and so you're spreading the ignorance is all you're doing is what i'm saying so yeah so actually pakistani songs pakistani music was always famous it's just that india has always been ripping them off you know and they've been putting them out as their own so that's confused the world and although i've put a very short you know very brief a uh, part of history to explain i hope it's clear still i hope it i think i made it clear as to why you know such a thing happened historically speaking as well so the brains half of the brains you know half of the muslim brains of the film industry came here half went back you know so half of the legends came here half went back you know so that's why that's why there is still a huge muslim influence in the indian film industry which as i said they've repeatedly tried to break by doing such shenanigans and in pakistan that is why until the 90s the production of movies uh was uh, amazing and you know a lot of our movies were again you know ripped off by the indian film industry you know by bollywood and songs too yes they have been ripping off songs that you know we made way back in the 50s you know and and very very popular songs that were so popular so viral you know that anybody who knew anything you know about this regions 
um, music, you know, they would know that this is Pakistan and India would just, you know, steal it and, you know, throw it out there as, and they would do such a bad job of it, you know. <laughs> it's like one YouTuber, you know, he was so sweet. I think he really also uh, said what, you know, he was like when he was raving about Turi Jandi, you know, Shazia Mazur and Hassan Rahim, the, the whole production, the whole set, everything. When he was raving about uh, Coke Studio, Zulfi's work and studio uh, in, in season 15 and 14, and he was like, you know, I'm telling you, I really hope and pray that America does not see this, that the, as in he was talking about the American industry. And he's like, because I am so afraid that what you people have made is so original and it's so classic you know, and it's it's out of this world, and they will go and make a cheap knockoff, and we don't want that. We don't want that. And you know, it was like exactly what we talk about, even you know, Korean dramas and all. Our biggest fears of you know about Korean dramas was, oh my God, if the Americans come in and if the American money comes in, they're just going to screw the whole Korean drama industry, and we're going to stop getting what it is. And it's true. Look, it's happening. Okay, I know the Korean industry is hopefully at least i'm hoping that they're aware of it and that they're trying to save it because i'm sorry but if you keep on churning whatever it is that the american money is making you churn you know for netflix and others you're going to lose the you know the the biggest part of your audience that made you global you understand all of us that you know watched you because we wanted to get away from the american unoriginal uh the british and the american unoriginality you know because they were beginning to get very annoying and they all seemed to just follow one genre you know literally literally in america it had come to this point where every single show you picked up seemed to have it looked as if there was just one person working on all of these shows you know um, whether it was Arrow 2.0, where the new generation starts, and then after that it was Sabrina, uh, the witch, you know, um, and the teenage witch, and then it was Archie, and then it was, you know, I mean, eh, and then obviously in our famous Charmed, seriously, what did you do with Charmed? I mean, they all had the same strain, the same genre, the same basic premise, the same, you know, they were all basically noir, you know, and I was, is this noir, dystopian, weird-ass sort of thing where everybody is, you know, um, I'm not going to say it anyway, but I mean, yeah, seriously, it's like literally one person was sitting in the American industry and, you know, di writing and directing all these shows. There was no originality left. I was it was maddening seriously so I stopped watching it for years ago years ago literally I don't remember the last time I actually watched you know even the flash even the flash went down that screwy path you know and I was like okay everybody's going down there seriously okay is there anybody here who's supposed to be different from the other person hello please tell me you know what the frack I was like okay that's it this is the end of the American entertainment industry that's it and I, I was worrying about Pakistani industry getting effed, but the American industry is even way more effed than ours. So down, you know, memory lane, I went for Chinese movies and then stumbled onto Korean dramas, which I would, to be honest, I resisted for a very long time before I actually decided to go for it. And, you know, and then when I started enjoying all of these Korean dramas, Japanese dramas, Thai dramas, Chinese dramas, and I was like, the one thing that started scaring me is that, listen, if any of these get too popular and the Americans come in, they're going to fry it to hell. And then I saw that there were so many people in the community who were have, beginning to have these fears too, you know, and I was hoping that Koreans would have enough sense not to fall into that trap. But unfortunately, they have fallen into that trap. And days go by before I actually get a good... I remember there was not a single day that didn't have a good Korean drama. So I literally watched a good, different Korean drama every single day. And now I'm literally waiting two to three days before I can get a good, decent drama that's aired. So, yeah that's not good sometimes in fact recently i've been a whole month without a korean drama come to think of it 
I had to pass my time watching other stuff, you know, looking for other stuff or binge watching older Korean dramas. Seriously, I have binge watched so many old, old Korean dramas like a thousand times. Those that I had already watched before years ago. And I, I just kept on and on rewatching so many of them. Can you imagine? Like I was so bored as hell waiting that there should be some good Korean drama coming. So yeah, Korean dramas have fallen into that trap. They need to dig themselves out very quick. I think they are attempting at it. That's why I'm saying that I think that they, they're aware of it because I see their attempts here and there with, for example, Love Next Door, um, DNA Lover, you know, um, yeah, um, uh, you know, Romance in the House, was it? Yeah, I mean, like I, I'm getting that, that they're trying to get that back. And I'm glad if they really are consciously trying to get that back because seriously, dudes, what have you been doing with yourselves recently? So, yeah, so, you know, when when he was like, you know, oh, I swear, I hope that Americans don't get this. I hope they don't get to see this because they're just going to copy it and they're going to make such a cheap ass knockoff out of it. And that is just going to and it's ruin it all. And that is so true. That is so true. Yes. So you see um, the one scene where Pakistan is, is keeping its originality is the music scene. And even in the, you know, the ideas, the concepts, you know, that Zulfi is working on, he is really, I think, kudos to the guy. I mean, he's not a new name in Pakistan, mind you. Zulfi is not a new name. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, in, I'm enjoying his, you know, his innovative work but yes i am so glad that he has this you know this journey series going on where he you know behind the scenes of each song because really some of his work they do need explaining because many of us from different backgrounds we associate different things with different obviously with different concepts com considering our backgrounds so those of us with western backgrounds for example we will automatically think that oh back to the future oh matrix oh you know you know so and then you explaining that it's actually a glitch then which all the words and all the timelines would collide and the past and the present and all yeah nice but i mean what we were seeing was that the person is wired you know his brain waves are being you know but uh, again, the, the very few people, few, few people actually understood the whole thing. Um, in fact, I only found two YouTubers who actually understood. And I was like, kudos, man, even I didn't understand <laughs> that part, but you got it as well. So, yeah, I think you should, you should watch the making of these songs so that you can understand them. Especially if you are, you know, somebody who is getting into the Pakistani music scene and you want to understand more. Um, one thing I also need to comment on because I've noticed a lot of YouTubers uh, were a bit, you know, confused about these things. First of all, Abda Parveen. Abda Parveen is a legend. She is a living legend. Um, most of the songs, um, I wouldn't call them songs. They're basically, again, mystical poetry. Most of the mystical poems that she sings are, you know, again, they're mystical poetry. So she is mostly into Kaval, you know, Kaval style and Sufi style singing. The same is with Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, who is, as we know, has passed away. And in fact, he is also a global legend. In fact, you know, he once very politely smacked India for ripping off his Sufiana Kalam and said that, listen, I wouldn't mind it if you actually asked me to come and sing it for you. I would have sung it for you, number one. Number two, this is a religious, mystical poetry. And you attributing the attributes of God to a human being and, you know, twisting my poetry like that, that is pretty offensive, you know. At least you should have had the courtesy not to do that. So, you know, him whipping their asses off with that. I mean, that was really kudos, man. You know, so, yeah, uh, understand that. Uh, yeah, here are a few names that you need to know. These are not new singers. These are 
already very very famous singers and they are actually famous on a global level even though you might may not have heard of them but they are literally globally famous so you have Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan obviously the one who sang uh, you know and who gave the soundtrack for Dead Man Walking right and then you've got um, Shazia Mazur yes she's also a pretty darn old singer in the sense that she's been singing for like 30 years okay um, Atif Aslam is also not a new name Ali Zafar is definitely not a new name um, you know then Abda Parveen as I said is a living legend Rahat Fateh Khan is the nephew and he was also the student of Nusrat Fateh Khan um, you know also notice a good giveaway of when you look at classical or Sufi, uh, you know, Kavali, Sufi singers, poets, um, you know, or even instrumentalists. Um, you know, when you see the word Ustad, U-S-T-A-A-D, when you see the word Ustad in front of them, know that they are, you know, they are not new because Ustad means maestro. Okay, so these are people who are maestros in their field, which means that they are not at all new in this field. So that is a good giveaway. That's a good hint. Whenever you see Ustad, understand they belong, you know, to an elite sort of, I think you'd call it elite really, because they're maestros. That means that they have mastered their field you know, that they are experienced in their field, in whatever it is that they're doing as, you know, kavals or as, you know, instrumentalists or as, uh, you know, ghazal, in ghazals or in, uh, you know, but it's mainly used for those who are into kavalis and into sufiana kalam. Okay. So, yeah, the traditional mystical uh, music industry you can say so and those who deal with again instruments those who have mastered instruments and they actually have students similarly those who have mastered singing the kaval style and they have so like Ustad Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan he had students one of them being his own nephew who was the person who could who was the closest in his style and he was the person who probably the only person who could literally mimic Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan you know so like a prodigy you can say so yeah that's why that's how we have Rahat Fateh Khan who is considered the musical heir to Nusrat Fateh Khan he's not an actual heir he's in musical heir <laughs> as in he's his you know he is now taking up on Nusrat Fateh path so I hope this clarified a few things. I hope I didn't leave anything out. Uh, in case I do, do tell me and I will do another episode. It's already been too long, I swear. It's an hour now. I need to stop. So this is me signing out for the half